Good morning, San Diego. My name's Nicole, and I just realized in the intro that I forgot to change the time. It's actually supposed to be 11 o'clock, believe it or not. <laughs> we did have to make a, a change to our schedule, so I apologize, but I did let the folks that had pre-registered know. So let's just talk about what we're doing here today. Um, my name's Nicole and I brought to you San Diego Spotlight. Uh, this is a platform for us to bring local small businesses to you and educate you on topics that are important to, to you. Um, today, we're bringing it to you live because every once in a while, it really feels like it needs to be a live conversation. And we want you to be able to communicate with our experts. So I don't know what platform you're on today. You could be on Roku, you could be on Fire TV, you could be on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. I don't know where you're at. Fred is broadcasting this. Um, but wherever you are, please feel free to type in any questions that you have. I've got my cell phone. If you see me looking down, it's because I'm looking up questions that are being fed to me from Fred, from you. Um, that way the experts can answer them for you. So again, this is live. Nobody's going to see you or hear you if you type in that question into the chat, so you can ask your questions anonymously, that's okay. I'm gonna to introduce to you um, the folks that I have here are experts. Um, Jack Crocker is the owner of several construction companies here in San Diego. He also happens to be my husband, and so he's here for that kind of support too. Um, but he's also the sponsor of San Diego Spotlight. Um, he's celebrating 10 years in business, and so um, as a gift back to the community, we are bringing other experts to the table for you to speak with. And that expert today is Fritzi Grodion. Did I say it right? Mary? Yes, oh, fabulous. Finally. Okay, good. <laughs> fabulous. I'm gonna have to skip my whole opening now because you said it right, you know? My funny opening is done. I may have to throw it in at the end just to do it. Perfect, right. perfect. So we were talking today about uh, multi-generational housing. What is it? What does it mean? Who does it? Why do they do it? And Fritzy, I, I was going to go on and on about all these great accomplishments that she's had. And then when we were practicing, she kind of got all red and she said, don't do that. So now I'm just going to make her do it. <laughs> okay. Is there anything else that you would like to say on my behalf? Or I could just, I'll just jump right in. I'm just going to have you jump right in. So Fritzy, okay. I know that you were um, educator of the year. I know yes. that you were, um, you've gotten so many different awards. I know that you've gotten speaker. What are the, all the awards that you've gotten for your speaking? Okay. In regards to aging in place and universal design. All right. We'll, we'll start with that segment. Perfect. We'll start with that segment. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jack, for sponsoring. And, sure. and thank you, Nicole, for the lovely introduction and getting my name right. <laughs> um, so for the audience, um, I am an instructor for the National Association of Home Builders, and I teach the certification for aging in place specialist. So that's a course for remodelers, designers, healthcare professionals, folks from lots of industries who want to learn more about the market itself, design concepts, and we do case studies together. So I do that one and I also teach a universal design course. My background coming into this space came from many years in New York and I may have, my accent may come out when I get started fast, <laughs> um, where I did environmental consulting for over 20 years. So I come from a variety of workspaces, residential, commercial, industrial, um, hazardous materials, um, lots of that kind of stuff. Uh, in the middle of the time I was doing that, I had a senior move management company, which at the time I have to confess, I thought I invented the industry in 2001. Uh, it turns out it was really invented two years before, um, but I did that for 10 years and moved about a thousand families from their homes. Uh, many of them had been in their homes for 40 years or more into communities, mostly into assisted living. Um, this was all in the, in the 2000s, and into assisted living or in with family or to other parts of the country. And at the time, I knew that people didn't want to move. I mean, I can tell you three people who were excited to move to assisted living at that time. Oh, I wouldn't want to. And so that, I, I knew that wherever my encore career was going to be, it was going to be an aging in place and helping people stay safely in their home for as long as makes sense for them. Mm -hmm. um, I 
it, when I started Hustle Guardians here in San Diego, I tried, you know, Forever Home as a tagline, and it's disingenuous because we can't make promises about people and forever. Um, but we can certainly make the interim between now and forever work better uh, for them. And so that was really my shift in the move to California to aging in place, although I have to confess I did do asbestos and lead-based paint work and training when I first came here too, <laughs> just as an aside. I so. feel like you landed in a better spot. But this, this is a spot that I really believe the breadth of folks that we can help mm -hmm. in so many ways is broader. So um, that's, that's a little bit about where I am. Okay, so let me, they talk, I've heard universal design, I've heard aging in place, mm -hmm. I've heard uh, multi-generational housing. Are they all the same thing? No. Okay, what, can you no. help us understand? <laughs> can you help us understand? Yes. A little um, bit? Yeah. Pretty briefly, too, mm -hmm. um, universal design, this is my favorite analogy, so y'all are getting my favorite analogy. <laughs> universal design is like a band that's been playing in the garage for about 30 years. They've been making great music, the neighbors love them, now they're a YouTube sensation and all of a sudden they're a rock star. <laughs> right? So universal design as a concept was developed over 30 years ago. And it's been out and part of the design world since then. So it's all about making spaces work for all people, all ages, all abilities. Okay. Period. So that anything that we do, and another, a, an easy example is a motion activated faucet. Mm -hmm. Right? You can be tall, you can be short, you can be left handed, right handed, young, old, you can have one hand, mm -hmm. and you can still get water. So that's universal design really in a nutshell. Okay. And aging in place it has evolved because people are, guess what, aging in place. And now some of the design concepts, some of them are universal design. Some of them are more specific designs, like adaptations. Okay. Uh, some of them are purely accessible because people have requirements that are purely accessible based on their challenges right now. I understand. So wheelchair. Right. So like wheelchair okay. accessibility. Okay. Um, the the other two design categories are visitable which also ties into and there are now standards for that which means making the ground floor of your home visitable by people of all ages and abilities. Ah, okay. So that's the zero step entrance. Okay. As an example. And the newest one is livable design, which really is like universal design. They've taken visitable with all their six or seven requirements and they've added a couple more for livable. Mm -hmm. But it's all part of the same space and I think that's been the big shift mm -hmm. now um, toward really just looking at it really in a more universal approach mm -hmm. to living in our homes. So multi-generational simply means, okay, there's more than one generation inside that home. Makes so, sense. So now how do we take what the multi-generational looks like and add these other design concepts and execute on those so that people can be multi-generational there. And it, and it extends from being just visitable mm -hmm. um, to being livable. So for example, we've got we've got grandkids and whenever they come I have to make sure that I've got the plugs and the um, electrical sockets and things like that. So you want to make sure that you're okay with the children as well as the grandparents and then anything in between. Right, because we're all, other than those of us who are both there and there, most of us are in between. Yeah, right? <laughs> and except for when you break both feet like I do. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> and she's back in high heels for those who can't see it. Okay, but thank you for that. Um, so yeah, and I think that's part of where we're going. So you asked about multi-generational and, and Jack and I had a chance to just briefly talk about this, but the National Association of Realtors has come out with now why there's been an even bigger shift toward it. 
Really? Um, so the first driver is people bringing aging parents in. Mm -hmm. um, after this last year, um, families have made decisions that living in a community, living in an assisted living, may not have the benefits that they thought it did. Mm -hmm. There's been social isolation there, been safety issues, health issues, etc. So now, how can we integrate mom or dad or both into our home? Mm -hmm. Um, and another reason too is people combining households to save money. I've heard a lot of that happening right now. Yeah, and we've oftentimes, at least from my generation, you know, we tease about having young adults move back home, mm -hmm. right? But they were forced to for college, right? Everybody, yeah. you shipped them all to college, and what? Guess what? Last year, they all showed up again. Right? Because yep. college was closed. <laughs> Hello, we've got some nodding over here, right? And now, for those, f they're not like, oh, college is open, I'm leaving again. I'm like, no, this worked out. You're right. right. This worked out great. So now, even if they transition into a professional life, the transition out into the first time home buyer market, nearly non existent. Well, especially in right? San Diego, half million dollar houses just for a of the starter home. Yeah, so, you know, this is a chance to save money mm -hmm. and be able to build up enough of a nest egg to, to make that change with a professional with some time, you know, in a career. And Jack, you had another great point about how the cost savings works for families looking to do even wealth transfer and some of those other ways. Yeah, we that see that all the time where um, you've got, you know, parents want to begin the wealth transfer to their kids. And to your point, it's so expensive to buy a first home. They might have a huge house in Arizona and their kids are in San Diego and they want to see the grandkids. So one thing they can do is sell their home, take that equity and do an addition or an ADU or invest in the home with their child, who's the adult. And that then becomes an asset that, you know, at some point will pass on to the children. Um, naturally without any sort of taxing or anything because they'll they'll own the home where that investment was made so that happens all the time too yeah, yeah. so like I know in my in my personal family <clears throat> my I've got an aging grandfather who's got cancer he's he's sadly not going to be with us very much longer and grandma's gonna sell the house and she's going to move in with my parents and they're considering right now, what do they do? Do they add um, an ADU in the back? Do they buy a manufactured home? Do they add on and go up and they go upstairs and grandma stays downstairs? So when you've got a family who's in that um, position where they have to consider their options, where, where do you go to look at the pros and cons to all of these? Do you have any resources that you can, I know you wrote a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did, I did write a book. Actually, here's my book, Grace oh. and Grit. Um, and I brought this to actually give to you as a thank oh. you at the end. Thank you. Um, so that book really talks to the challenges of different kinds of families making the decision about what to do next. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of starting mm -hmm. for, that ex for your example, the first place that I start, because now it's my niche, is uh, really home safety. Like okay. how does how does your current home look in terms of how the or the the folks? So, yeah. for Grandma moving in, is that going to be a good space for her? Okay. And again, if it's multi-story, we were talking about how do we use different flex spaces. Mm -hmm. Right? How do we, and, and that goes back also to now we have lots of folks home. So the first step is to really analyze what they have. Okay. And then go from there and kind of make that list or what are the things? Are there any accommodations? Does grandma have any physical challenges or health challenges now? If not, all of the changes really can simply be the universal changes that will work for everybody no matter whether the grandma's living with them or not. So there, if there is a bedroom on the main floor, then, you know, or if there isn't, mm -hmm. let's say there isn't. So are people using the dining room? I mean, that's, you, you must have seen lots of different kinds of 
changes for folks in spaces. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, especially in this last year. You know, what used to be the dining room is now the office and the classroom and the dining room. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. So, you know, it, like you said, it, there's um, lots of different ways to use the space. And the more people that are in the space are all going to be trying to use it at the same time. So you need to be able to have like different areas where people can do stuff so that you're not always on top of each other. So for like in my in my case, can I kind of walk through that house and can you sure. give me a couple of like tips of things like maybe you guys can say you should really make sure you consider I don't know, let's see. I'm All walking right. up to I'm walking <laughs> up to the house. I'm walking right. up to my parents' house and what things do I need to look out for to make sure that it's safe for my grandma to move in there when I'm considering let's see what I can do with the existing space. Am I looking okay. at I, I know it's a first story house. Right. And I'm walking up to, to the front door right now and I can see there's a, a little step. What what are our options for steps? Do we take them down to a zero? Do we put slopes? What are some of our options? And do I need to be concerned about something like that? Um, okay, so if there's lighting. Lighting, okay, do you right. consider lighting? So let's walk up to the house. Okay. Let's walk up to the house in the daylight. So we're just kind of looking at the pathway. Is it smooth, are there cracks? What's the surface of it? Mm -hmm. And we're walking up to that first step, okay. right? Now, I had an example of three front doors, as a matter of fact, oh. to show you, which is concrete walkway, concrete entrance, bluestone walkway, bluestone entrance, mm -hmm. right? And then concrete walkway, bluestone entrance, mm -hmm. just because we want to be able to see where that step is. So you can do it with lighting, Okay. Um, for actually those the three houses that I have in the in the photograph, and you may be able to show it to folks later. Yeah, I'll plug it play it later. Um, actually, I ended up putting motion sensor lights for the blue stone, blue stone, because I was so nervous about the woman living there. Yeah. I just went at night. I put the lights there. I left. I didn't even let her know who did it. Mm -hmm. But I was I couldn't bear to see that woman go in and out of her house without knowing that. You know, a complete stranger coming to the house would trip over her for you. Yeah. So that's where you start the pathway, the lights. Okay. Um, are you going to need a railing? Are you going to need like a railing on the outside of the house or just a little rail to hang on to for that step going in? Gotcha. Okay. And then as you go into the front door, how does the lighting happen? Is there mm -hmm. an overhead light? Is the doorbell lighted? Mm -hmm. Is there a motion sensor light? I was just going to ask about motion sensors. Are there a lot of motion sensors going into to homes right now? Yeah, there? people are definitely, mm -hmm. I mean, you can do with the smart home, you can have cameras, you can have where when you open the garage door, all the other lights that you need for the entrance automatically come on just mm -hmm. by entering your garage door code. Yeah. There's a lot of ways with smart home technology to sort of take care of your pathway. Okay. Yeah. 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 Interesting. And there are simple battery operated motion sensor lights too mm. that you can mount on the side of the house and just focus the light at the lock set so you'll be able to see that. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's we just kind of gotten up to the front door. Is there a doormat? Is it one of those high raffia ones with a fancy design on it? Mm -hmm. Is it low? Is it non-slip? Yeah. Right? What's the door handle like? Do you push the door open? Do you turn a knob? Should you have a levered handle? So many details to. We're not think even about. in the front door yet, girl. <laughs> <laughs> right? We are not even in the front door. Also, a little table mm -hmm. by the front door to put your packages on mm -hmm. as you go in. So, because if you just put that stuff down, then you can manage the lock. And there are smart locks, remote locks fob locks, all of those kinds of things. Um, there's a new one that's a levered handle that you can also push to release the latch. Uh -huh. So those, so, okay, so now we've gotten there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, <laughs> we're in the front door. We're, we're almost, we almost are in the front door. We haven't turned the handle and gone in yet, okay? Because now we're looking at that threshold between oh. the entryway mm -hmm. and the door. So. Is that little bit of a thing a tripping hazard or not? That's right, because you do start, you're not lifting your legs up as high when you're, when you're getting older, so. Right, so there, that can be just a little tiny transitions ramp that you can, you know, do that 
integrates. Mm -hmm. You could do something with the, the way the mat works in there. Are those so, custom? Like the doors? The thresholds? No. No? Okay. No. I don't it depends when you order the door. You can get low threshold mm -hmm. doors, um, which would I be a special I didn't order. know that was an option. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now we've, we've figured out whether we can open the knob. We've got a levered handle. We've got lights. Mm -hmm. We've gotten over the threshold. Okay. So now we're in the house. Mm -hmm. Now right. we're in the house and now we're in the living room. Because I'm like, you haven't seen my house out yet. No, I haven't. <laughs> I just, Why is she staring at me like that? <laughs> because I just got you up to the front door okay. now. So we walk into the front door and their house walks straight into the living area. Okay. Um, they don't have a fireplace or anything. It's a pretty open space. And then it backs into um, their kitchen to the left-hand side. Mm -hmm. And in the kitchen space, so grandma's, she's shorter. She's five foot, nothing. Um, so I know she can't get up super high, right. but what other kind of considerations do I need to think about in the kitchen space for aging in place? Lighting. Lighting again? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. We need, those of us who are over 65 mm -hmm. need 30% more light than you do. Really? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I knew that you lost color. Like some color would fade off into different yeah, now, but yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, and we also, as we get even older than me, mm -hmm. right, we also lose our peripheral vision very, very gradually. Okay. So when we're in our 20s, our peripheral vision goes way back. Like we can see the world. Yeah, that's because we're invincible at 20s. I literally see him out of the corner of my eye. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> but when you're 75, your ability to see that is going to have slowly diminished and you won't know that it has. Mm -hmm. You won't know that you're missing that. Really? Yes. That so that even, that's why you, you may have to turn your head further mm -hmm. to actually see something. And, but, but because it's been gentle and it's happened to you over a period of time, you don't know that. Mm -hmm. And that's another reason why lighting is so important. Okay. Yeah. I remember actually you did a remodel for somebody who um, I think had cancer at one point. I'm not sure, but you had opened up some windows in the house for them. Do you remember that? It was going to that beautiful house, by the way. I'll, I'll show you guys a picture another time. Um, but I wonder if that's why, because I think he was wanting just some sunshine because he was mm -hmm. he was bedridden most of the time. Right. So right. that's interesting. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So different kinds of lighting in the kitchen. What would you recommend for folks for the different Sky areas? Lights. Well, I always, in any design, whether it's aging in place, maybe it's universal design is what I'm doing, mm -hmm. but I always tell people, put as much lighting or more lighting than you think you need, because you can always put it on dimmers and you don't have to turn it all on. So in a kitchen specifically, what you want to watch for is you don't want to have all the light behind you because then you cast your own shadow. And the harder it is to see, the, the, har the, the older you get, the harder it is to see, and those shadows can really get dangerous when you're chopping and things like that. Oh, yeah. So I'll have lights above the fridge, I'll have lights near all the entrances, of course all the way through the middle, mm -hmm. but then we'll do under counter lights, which people Perfect. think are night lights, uh -huh. and they are, but they're <laughs> also for, so you can see what's directly in front of you. So if, for example, when you're chopping, the light behind you is throwing a shadow, but the light in front of you is making it nice and bright. We'll do a brighter light, so it's, it might, be too glaring for overhead, mm -hmm. but a bright light just gives you lots of ability to see. So those are some of the things we consider in all projects, but um, specifically with universal design and aging in place, lots of light is really important. Okay. Plus it makes your kitchen look beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> it makes all the colors pop. <laughs> there you go. There you go. But on the, on the other side of that now, you've got to think about reflection, shiny surfaces, where your work areas are, and contrast. Okay. So contrast can be very important so that you know where the edge is. Ah, okay. So the contrast, so that if your countertop and your floor are contrast, mm -hmm. then you'll know that that's the edge. Right. Right, and yeah. so that can be a big help right there. Just, oh, just as, the little things and, that you don't think of. And from the design point of view. So again, so we're in the kitchen. What's easy for grandma to use in terms of the kitchen sink? Do you have a levered handle, mm -hmm. right? Do you have old, you have kitchen knobs, mm -hmm. right? So maybe a levered handle on the kitchen sink with the gooseneck. Okay. Maybe an automated faucet. Oh yeah, Kohler has that new one that's touchless. It's really neat, I just saw. Yeah, and now with the smart home, right? You can tell the kitchen faucet, I need one cup of water at 120 yeah. degrees. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. yeah. So neat. So neat. Yeah. So, okay, I wouldn't have to worry about the bar seating that they've got. There's no concerns there, right? Well, you didn't mention that they had yeah, bar Yeah, well, seating. she's got, yeah, in the, in, the kitchen, there's, in the kitchen, there's like a little bar height, um, three chair seating area. Yeah, as, yeah, if she doesn't have, as long as, but check the seats, mm -hmm. check the, you know, make sure everything is firm, balanced, mm -hmm. right? Maybe she would be comfortable if she had one of those that had the little arms on it, mm -hmm. just to be able to hop up so on it more easily. When you're looking Especially at since she's five feet. Yeah, but she's so, she's so, sorry, Grandma. <laughs> yeah, she's no. She's so short. <laughs> that's great. That's, uh, you know, that's, I was going to ask you something about, um, oh, what was it? Shoot, I just lost my train of thought, but it was a, about the bar. Oh, with the, the edge. Um, any, any concerns about the countertops there with edges on the bars? I think there's different edges and whatnot. They're not going to affect grandma anyhow. I don't, it, it depends on I what kind imagine. of edge in your edges. Well, I'm thinking I mean, like the edge of the countertop on the bar. Like it's, there's not, I can't there, think of Are there corners? There's corners, yeah. Yeah. But I they're mean, rounded. No, oh, perfect. She's good. Okay. So when you go in there and you're looking at houses, because mm -hmm. you mentioned furniture too, are you looking at, every, you're looking at furniture as well? Uh, most, of the, most of the time <laughs> on the home safety side, um, I, I'm only looking at furniture, I'm looking at furniture two ways. One, to see that it's stable if a person has, is having trouble getting up and down. Yeah. Like a chair like this with arms, mm -hmm. fabulous. Um, but also for distance mm -hmm. because sometimes folks need a little more room to walk around the coffee table mm -hmm. to walk between the chairs and so and we don't want any extension cords that kind of thing so yeah i don't i don't analyze furniture okay. per se <laughs> kind of but but when you mentioned it it's like it's one of those things that you just you don't think about but if all of a sudden one of those stools wasn't steady, you know, if it lost one of those little foot things on the bottom and mm -hmm. it was just enough to throw somebody off. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So moving on to my grand or to my parents' house. Now we go into the hallway. Okay. And it's a uh, two bedrooms on that side and, and one little bathroom and it's a tub. It's got two, two vanities, standard, you know, two vanity bathroom, toilet, tub shower. Um, would I need to get that thing out and do a zero edge shower? I've heard of those. Uh, it again, it depends on grandma's capabilities now and mm -hmm. what your folks want to do. Gotcha. But curbless showers are a great solution for everybody. Is that what they're called, curbless? Curbless, and, yeah. and Jack can tell you more about why. And <laughs> yeah, why? I know that's for wheelchairs, but I don't know much else. Are there um, any other considerations in that shower space or the tub space? Well, it just depends on. Um, on, like you said, their ability to get in and out. So when you have a shower, you have to step up. When you have a tub, you have to step up and over the tub to get in, which isn't so hard, but it's a lot harder to come out because now you're wet mm -hmm. and you're gonna get onto the floor. So sometimes people can't lift their legs. It's a tripping hazard. Um, in a lot of homes, there's sliding shower doors. So if somebody needs assistance in the tub, you have to fight the track and fight the shower door. So it really depends on if people need assistance. Sometimes you have to take those out, put a curtain in. Mm -hmm. um, the, then the next thing would be like showers, mm -hmm. and those are gonna have a lot narrow, smaller of a curb. And that's probably 99% of all showers are gonna have those curbs. And they're typically not a big deal because you have to enter the shower anyway, and a small little three inch step isn't that big of a deal because it's also only one inch on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, and even if you're in a wheelchair, you typically have to do a transfer at some point anyway. So people right. think, if I need a wheelchair, I want to roll the wheelchair in. Mm -hmm. Well, if you do that, then the wheelchair gets wet, right? <laughs> and then what? <laughs> at some point, you're going to have to trade chairs. Yeah. So you can go to the edge of the shower, do a transfer, and have a wet chair or a seat or something like that, and do assistance. If you're using a walker and you want to do stuff by yourself, or if you have a wet chair, then you can go with the zero edge. The nice thing with the zero edge is you can roll right in, you can shuffle right in, there's nothing to trip over, and you can enter the shower. They can be beautiful, by the way, because your yes. bathroom floor can carry right on into the shower. Mm -hmm. um, the downsides are they're very expensive in an existing home. On a second story, they get even more tricky to do for all kinds of construction reasons. Um, and 
Sometimes the shower doors, if the sweep's too hard, they're hard to, to work, or if they're too loose, they can get wet. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of pros and cons to both, but they're definitely beautiful. They're mm -hmm. um, very elegant looking, and they're the most versatile of the bunch. Yeah. So I know that flooring is a big deal when you're aging in place and universal design as well. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've slipped and fallen on tiles before. Are there specific tiles for the shower space that you should purchase when considering moving an elderly person into the home? There's a slip resistance rating, okay, um, and the standard was 0.6 of the coefficient of friction, which sounds sounds like I really haven't a clue. <laughs> there's no coefficient of friction measuring device like you. There's a stud finder to find, right? There's no, so it comes on the tile. So the answer is yes. You want slip resistance in your tiles. If you've got the little tiny one-inch tiles with a bunch of grout, you've mm -hmm. achieved that. Okay. Um, and so if you're choosing a tile, the slip resistance will be on there Okay. Um, as well. I think that's the easiest way to do it. And there are some products that you can actually use on top of existing tiles to um, make the surface itself more slip resistant mm -hmm. as an interim mm -hmm. while you're planning to do the remodel or whatever. So you could make that bathroom a little bit safer for grandma now mm -hmm. while you're looking and organizing how it is that you want to do what the next steps are going to be. And yeah. that's where you go through the decision about do we want a curved shower, curbless shower, mm -hmm. and those other decisions about the space. Yeah. So you can make the space safer. Mm -hmm. um, one of my personal soapboxes you just stand on it, um, <laughs> is grab bars. Okay. Grab bars are the new seat belts, mm -hmm. right? Those of us who were old enough when seat belts were invented, right? Mm -hmm. Locked them behind us, sat on them, stuffed them down the sides. At the time, we believed as consumers that it was safer to be thrown from your car. I remember that. <laughs> right? Than put on a seat belt, yep. right? My parents were pissed. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely, right. But. The same way now, that's what grab bars and safety bars are for us. So in your parents' home, they're not gonna do the tub, they're not gonna do the bathroom before grandma moves in, mm -hmm. a vertical grab bar by the entrance as she steps in. And again, to Jack's point, they are beautiful. You know, matte black. I mean, you can get all of these finishes, yeah, old world bronze. It doesn't bronze. have to look like you're walking into a hospital anymore. No, absolutely not, mm. absolutely not. And they can be into it, towel bars, soap dishes, toilet paper holders, what? all of them that all match uh -huh. whatever design you choose, those are, those can be grab bars. Interesting. I mean, they're designed to, to be that yeah. um, and to integrate in the design. So when you go into the bathroom, you think, oh, this is really cool. Look, they've got all the latest mm -hmm. whatever and it's safer. Yeah. Well, and I would add to that too. Um, what I've seen a lot is in a bathroom, and again, this goes to universal design. You don't have to be 80 to need to do these things. Mm -hmm. Everyone should do them. Um, to speak to the, the slip resistant tile, the easiest way that I could, I mean, there's coefficients of fission and all that, but basically if you just think of this, you don't want any shiny tile where it can get wet because shiny tile is slippery when it's wet. And I don't care if you're 10 or 100, you're gonna slip. So you wanna have something that's got a matte finish. Um, the more sort of leathery finish it is, the more resistant it's gonna be. Um, like you were saying, smaller tile has more grout. That obviously is very grippy, mm -hmm. so that's good. And then I would also say in the bathrooms that you should have, even if you don't wanna put them in because you're still in the seat belt behind your, your back phase, mm -hmm. I always recommend when you're remodeling a bathroom, put backing in for it. Mm -hmm. And then before we cover it up, just put a tape measure out and take a picture. And then ah. that way you've got wood to screw it to later when you need it mm -hmm. because a grab bar is no good if it's just screwed into the drywall because it's actually worse because you're gonna trust it and you're gonna hurt yourself. And the other thing I tell people is to, if you don't put in towel bars, put in a grab bar to use as a towel bar. Cause I can't oh, tell you how many times I've seen to your point, uh, making it a visitable space. Mm -hmm. Grandpa comes over, he starts to slip. What's the first thing you do? You grab the, the towel bar, which mm -hmm. is not designed for, false sense of security, you're hitting the floor. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and they're not hospital grab bars with knurled corners and stuff like you've seen. They really can, I would have to tell you, they're a grab bar for you to even notice. Yeah. 
Really? And so mm -hmm. I would say put them in cool. and, and just make right. them part of your space and nobody will know the difference and it's safer. Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, it seems like a no brainer, honestly. Um, showers, handheld showers, I know are a thing. And I, mm -hmm. I can visualize one of the bathrooms that you remodeled with your company and it had one when you were walking out of the shower and it had, so one vertical and it had one horizontal. Um, was that for walking in and out of the shower, I suppose? And then one for if you're in the shower and just need to get your balance? Um, How many are recommended in this space? Are you talking about grab bars or showers? Grab bars in the shower, sorry. Gotcha. Well, I'll let you answer that. That's your specialty. <laughs> um, <laughs> typically two. Typically two? Okay. Right. And the horizontal, a horizontal and a vertical. Okay. And if a and if a client or someone has a very specific concern or challenge, then you can do more. But um, people will ask, sometimes ask for diagonal. Oh. And diagonal is only allows you to hold on to it while you slide down. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's so, got it. <laughs> um, yeah, and so the real recommendation is, hor is horizontal and, and vertical. Okay. Um, but if someone wants one, like by a toilet area, then the style and how you mount that really depends truly, and this is going to be very graphic for the audience, how somebody gets up and down off the toilet. Okay. Because some people will pull themselves up and some people will push themselves off. Mm -hmm. Depends on their strength. How their... weird, because it's something I've never thought of, but that makes a lot of sense. Oh, trust me, girl. I know a lot of things you've never thought of. <laughs> 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 Remember, we just took out, think about how long it took us to get in the front door of your parents' house. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Great, yeah. So, so okay, yeah. that's interesting. So we've gone through like a bathroom in the kitchen space and you were talking about the dining room being a dining room, an office and all that. And I'm thinking, well, mom's not using her office anymore. She's retired. So maybe we can just add a little kitchenette in the back and call it, can I call that an ADU? If I just added a kitchenette to a bedroom? Well, an ADU is a technical term that oh. the cities use. And mm -hmm. so there's gonna be specific requirements mm -hmm. for it to be considered an ADU. Mm -hmm. um, but an ADU, it stands for accessory dwelling unit. So whether you use a technical term or whether you say, is this a space where mom could have a small kitchen to completely separate. Oh, okay. I'm thinking multi-generational housing, slap in a little kitchen spread up the house. You know, is that how you people do it? I don't know. What are you seeing? How are people creating two households in one space? Well, that's a, a really long conversation and it really, oh. what it, what it really comes down to. Seems like to, you can't just throw in a box in the back. <laughs> <laughs> no, you could. <laughs> I don't know if mom would like it, uh, um, grandma wouldn't. but what it really comes down to and what we try to talk about when people are, and this is important, right? When you're first beginning the idea or the thought process of bringing a parent in or whether you're worried about your own future and are trying to do aging in place for yourself, the, the important thing is design and how do you use the space? What's your per procession like in the mornings? How do you do things? What don't you need as much as what do you need? Mm -hmm. In a multi-generational house, I think that we've done a lot of them and one of the most important aspects of that is you wanna have common areas and common spaces because the whole idea of multi-generational is that grandma gets to hang out with the grandkids okay. and you get to see your mom and dad and your mom and dad get to see you and all those sorts of things. That's very important, right? It could even be that you need to share meals together because maybe someone doesn't have the ability to cook. And that could, by the way, mean that um, both parents are working and the, the grandparents are doing the cooking. It doesn't mean inability to cook, right? right? So you may wanna have shared kitchen and shared eating. However, no matter how much you love your family, you're going <laughs> to want time to separate a little bit. Right. And so what I've seen a lot is that you've got common spaces where everybody can meet as a family, but you've got retreats around the house where people can literally retreat go quietly read a book. Kids can go quietly do their homework or play video games that are not so quiet so that people can be quiet in the main part of the house. Mm -hmm. And so as we talk through those needs and what your specific situation is, then we're going to know how to address it. One of the biggest things where we're merging two families together is space because grandma and grandpa have a 3,000 square foot house. Mm -hmm. The kids managed to use the entire house they had before grandma and grandma showed up. Mm -hmm. So you have to merge the space but you also have 3,000 square feet of furniture. Mm -hmm. And you've got 50 years of photo albums and stuff that you did in first grade that you can't believe your mom still had. Those all have to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. So storage and furniture usage is a big, big part of planning this. Yeah. 
Wow. Yeah. Interesting. So yeah. when you're talking about, and I know that you teach um, aging, what, do, what is it called, the certification? Certified Aging in Place Specialist, the CAPS. CAPS, yeah. Yes. So can you tell us about that and does it, are all interior designers required to get that certification or is it a specialty and what is it? Um, CAPS is a, is a certification offered by National Home Builders mm -hmm. and it's a choice. It's a designation, it's a three-day process. Um, we look at marketing and selling, we look at the, the market in different uh, segmentation mm -hmm. other than just demographics which for me, when I took the course myself before I began to teach it, was the biggest light bulb moment. Okay. And, um, and then there's days on the designs, these universal design concepts, and then specific for the other design categories we talked about before, and then um, case studies, mm -hmm. implementation, some more construction best practices are taught. Okay. So remodelers who have been doing one kind of remodeling mm -hmm. um, can pick up some information about this niche. Mm -hmm. This area is not going away mm -hmm. um, and I have had students in my class who only do a certain kind of building or a certain kind of remodeling mm -hmm. and even as we come out of this economy, even as there are other changes, we're still going to be doing bathroom and kitchen remodels mm -hmm. and bathroom remodels are going to be among the leading places that we move in the next couple of years especially. Yeah. Um, and again, it's where all those universal design features come into play. You know, the right, the same way if you, and I just, this is a very strange analogy, but I was just thinking about the toilet seat covers yeah. that have the one for kids built in. Mm -hmm. Have you, the, yeah. Okay, well for me that was, I was like sh sh shocked. I didn't have any grandkids. Uh -huh. so. Uh, maybe in the future. Um, anyway, but the idea that right built into that cover was the potty seat, mm -hmm. that was clearly for me, that was a universal design piece. Yeah. You know? Um, things like that that we do are going to work really for everybody mm -hmm. and having those, those features. So should, if somebody's looking to bring in and create a multi-generational home, do they reach out um, to, to you to help them design a space that's gonna work for everybody? How does that, or do they want to look for a certified person? Like what's the benefit to the homeowner? For um, a person with the CAPS training uh -huh. or the universal design training, mm -hmm. we know that that has just adds a vocabulary and a framework for asking the right questions. Okay. So Jack already asks the right questions, mm -hmm. um, but I know your team is also participating in getting these designations as well, yeah. because it, it just builds out the conversation and, and the look at how we ask those questions, and maybe there are more questions that we're going to need to be asking. So that's, um, but people from all kinds of professions, healthcare professionals take the course as well, so that oh. they can under, I have lots of occupational therapists take the class so that they can understand the construction side a little bit better mm -hmm. because so many times as occupational therapists they make a recommendation like the grab bar should go here mm -hmm. and you know this needs to go here and this needs to go here and then a remodeler will just shake their heads and go you've got no idea what you're talking about I can't do that and they don't understand why they get pushback. Uh, so the class really gives a chance for people from different disciplines to actually work together in the classroom mm -hmm. and learn from each other as well. Yeah. Uh, so that's one place to start. Yeah. Okay. Well, I yeah. know that it's um, people don't know what they don't know. Right. And we don't know what to. That's like me. I am stumbling a little bit because I'm like I just don't understand that world. I'm coming into it. I mean, I'm we're we're careening towards it. <laughs> so I need to start understanding it. Right. <laughs> Right, so right. I really appreciate that. Right. I'm trying to think, oh, you know, I haven't even checked to see if there was any questions yet. I'm so sorry. I get so into my own little head when I'm doing these things. Let's see. Okay, so while you're looking that up, the other thing that another place to start is mm -hmm. with the home safety assessment. Okay. So that's a, a play, that's through Household Guardians. That's one of the things that I'll do is go into someone's home and I'm invited in by older adults, I'm invited in by their children who are concerned and see some changes in mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And then that gives us also a place to start. So it's not necessarily I'm going right to the remodel. Mm -hmm. It's like, what are the safety things? Like thinking about your folks' house and grandma moving in, mm -hmm. right? They may want to look in, down the road at how we can 
integrate her living with us the best way we can. Mm -hmm. But right up front, if somebody looks at the house and tells us the lighting things, the door handle, some of those easy things that we can do that would keep grandma safe mm -hmm. while the family is working on that plan. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know if I'm going to put you on the spot right here. Yeah. Um, okay. Assessments like that, do they run thousands and thousands of dollars? Are they? No. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't, no. I don't know. Do you know? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, have, I, have, I have a questionnaire. It's about 240 points. Okay. And so, yes, it's, it's a couple hundred dollars. Okay. Very yeah. affordable. Very worth it. It's, yeah. And, and then where I also go to is recommending especially here in, in the county local resources okay for folks who and then if it looks like they're going to move right away then finding you know companies like classic home to be able to really take somebody right away and move them like okay. if if they know right away we're moving from yes non-slip mats would be a good idea but what we know already we need a bathroom remodel we need some exterior work done, we need those things right away, mm -hmm. then I get a chance to refer to uh, folks to actually be able to work with the clients. And sometimes mm -hmm. I give the clients some basic ideas, give them a checklist of questions to ask the contractors, mm -hmm. you know, go to CLSB and check their licenses, you know, that kind of thing right. um, as well. So, uh, it, you know, it helps, it helps me build our community too, and that's been one of the things that's helped by being a member of NARI. Yeah, NARI's, NARI's great. You've been part of NARI for what, five, ten years? Ten Something years, like yeah. Ten years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Twice um, as long as me. I want to, oh, <laughs> they put the link to your book in the um, chat. So if you guys want to purchase her book, which is Grace oh. and Grit, oh, tell us a little you. bit about how this came to be really quick. Okay, really quick. I moved to California. I didn't know anybody. I started to network with every possible networking organization I could find online, mm -hmm. right? So I go to networking meetings and what do you say? Like, I'm an asbestos person? No, I just came here from New York. No, that doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm. So I used, I'm writing a book because on my laptop, there was a folder marked book and I had my ideas in there. Okay. <laughs> so I'm about six or seven months into this whole networking thing and I'm telling people, yeah, Hi Jack, nice to meet you. What do you do for it? Oh well, I'm writing a book. Okay. Well, I wasn't. Okay. <laughs> Every time I opened my laptop, I had a folder marked book, right? Uh -huh. And then I said, this is disingenuous. So I better either write the book or delete the folder from my laptop. I've got to have I've got to have another line at networking. So I just took some time because I couldn't delete it. I couldn't let the stories go. Yeah. And a woman from Northern California said to me, if you have ten chapters, just write the book. Mm -hmm. So. The, um, that's what I did. I had 10 chapters and my f one of my favorite parts of the book actually is the table of contents. Really? <laughs> um, because chapter one, don't talk to me, talk to me, don't talk to my daughter. Oh. <laughs> chapter three, I can still see the photographs in my mind. It was a client who was blind and her family just presumed that she was not able to really and we um, sat with the photo albums and she touched the pictures and she could tell me who the people were in the pictures because oh she goodness. knew those photo albums so long um the kids don't want our stuff <laughs> <laughs> um, she's just like her father but i could divorce him <laughs> i don't want to live another day around all these old people hide the painting in the elevator my brother's coming oh my god <laughs> so these are these are real stories. Uh -huh. Most of the names are changed. Mm -hmm. uh, in the hide the painting one, the man who worked for me at the time and actually hid the painting, um, which was huge, mm -hmm. like eight feet tall. It was an enormous thing that we got into this elevator. And in the story, I say he was in there 15 minutes, but he told me it was really 25 that I left him in this elevator <laughs> with this. Painting from the, it was this huge painting from the 1800s. Yeah. An original oil of, I don't know. Anyway, so Lou's name is not changed in the book because I just couldn't change his name. He had to get real credit for holding it. <laughs> so these stories are really about families, generational considerations. And I wrote them so that people in different generations would see that the other person is, is right too. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's ways great. to have the conversation. And the last chapter is about my mom and her decision to stay home to the end of her life. And so, in the prologue, you meet my son mm -hmm. and how I got into senior move management. And at the end, you meet him again in the epilogue when he and I are having a conversation about 20 years later about what that looks like and, that is and really why neat. I did the work. Yeah. I'm gonna read that tonight actually. I'm pretty excited to read that. Yeah, it's a quick read, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> believe me, the chapters will go like this. And it's always fun for me to find out from folks what their favorite chapter was. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people like the hide the painting one. Yeah. Um, but I just I'll just tell you one more yeah, quick please. story. So the woman who was my copy editor, uh, a good friend of my mom, she's in her eighties in Vista. Mm -hmm. and she'd been an English professor. So I said to her, Miss Evelyn, would you read my book mm -hmm. and put in commas or whatever? So she took the manuscript in the three ring binder, right, mm -hmm. over to her house. And it, she didn't bring it back and she didn't <laughs> bring it back. I was like, what the hell, it must be terrible. So she finally comes back with it and she goes, you know, there was only about three places, but she said, I got lost in the stories. Mm -hmm. And there's a story in there about a woman, Lois, who is flamboyant. Mm -hmm. She's in her 80s. She's moving into assisted living. Her son is in his 50s and he's the one who demonstrates the grace um, because her boyfriend is younger than her son. Mm -hmm. And so apparently, yeah, her boyfriend was younger than her son. So, but she was just a sculptor, a painter. She was just like, yeah. well, my copy editor had a younger sister whose name was Lois. Mm -hmm. Now, at the time, my copy editor was 83, and the sister was eight, was 80, right? For 80 years, she had tried to get Lois to be a sensible kid, right? Her younger sister was never sensible. Mm -hmm. And when she read that chapter, it gave her pause, and she and her sister reconnected. She said, Aww. I began to feel some compassion for why I've been trying to make her behave for 80 years, and she's just never going to do it. And they got wow. back together. That's really neat. Yeah. So you just, you don't know, you yeah. know? Yeah. You don't know. I wrote, a, I wrote a blog six years ago about grab bars, mm -hmm. and a man that I went to high school with put grab bars in his mother's shower in Tennessee. And I thought it was two paragraphs. Right, and there's a grandma in Tennessee who's safer. Nice. So those are my those are my big moments. I love it. Thank you for <laughs> sharing. So, um, folks, we're we're actually out of time. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and we'll respond to your guys's questions um, separately from here. Um, really quick, if you could, Fritzy, to this camera right here. Oh, okay. Let's talk. Um, uh, let's. How can people get a hold of you? What's the name of your company? Okay, locally, uh, I'm at Household Guardians. So Fritzy, F-R-I-T-Z-I, -I, at HouseholdGuardians.com. Um, and also I do the other training and home safety work through Age Safe America. So Fritzy at Age Safe America or Household Guardians, either one is a great way to get hold of me. Okay, fantastic. Jeff, Thank you. Anything you want to add before we head out? No, no, I think this is great. If you guys have any concerns or questions about this sort of thing, it always is good to ask because there, for everything you're thinking of, there's probably five more things that you should consider. So get somebody involved that does this all the time and you'll get really good input, stuff you haven't even considered before. All right. Thanks guys, have a great week. We'll see you next week.